Right. Welcome everybody to this exchange session on mental health. Uh, today we're joined by Laura, and not only is she the owner of MAPS Training, a mental health first aid instructor, and an award-winning training and development professional with over 22 years experience, she's passionate about removing the stigma, stigma of mental health and improving all our knowledge of those individuals who are suffering and those of us who can help support people. So today's session will follow the way we've done things before. We'll have Laura talking to you all and giving lots of tips and things like that. And then at the end of it, we'll have a Q&A and you can just use the, uh, type in your questions and we'll read them out. So thank you everyone for joining us and I'll hand you over to Laura. That's brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, Deborah. I'm hoping that uh, everybody can see my slides and I don't need my introduction slide anymore because you've done a beautiful job of doing it. Um, but the one thing I would say is the fact that I am very passionate about improving everybody's access to mental health support um, due to own personal lived experiences and those of family as well. So it's a really important topic to me. So what we're going to be looking at today in the agenda uh, is, first of all, we're going to be looking at what is mental health, which is a bit of a strange term to start with. Generally, we often know what mental ill health is, but we're not really that sure what mental health is. Um, a very brief uh, a look at what the the effect of the pandemic has been on the nation's mental health. And then the most important bits of this talk are around spotting signs of um, stress and mental ill health in yourself and in others. Uh, and also giving you an, a, a mental health assistance framework, which is something that I've created myself. You can see the little mnemonic there and we'll be exploring this. You'll notice that it spells out the word aches and it's all about helping to uh, alleviate someone's aches and their pain really is what we're gonna be looking at now. So when we consider what exactly is mental health, because it's a very strange term really, um, the best way to describe it, it's our emotional, psychological and social well-being, And we measure the quality of this in certain ways because it's how we're behaving and how we're thinking. So effectively, it's how we feel about ourselves, our lives, our vision of the future, um, how we cope with ups and downs of, every, of everyday life. But really, it's how well we cut our resilience levels. How do we uh, how do we cope with acute life events and stresses? And for example, one of the reasons why we know that the pandemic has had such a, a huge impact on people's mental health is the fact that never before in one go has everybody all been affected by the same stress at one time. So this is a document I've downloaded from Mental Health First Aid England, and there are numerous free resources that you can get to if you log on to their site. But this sort of talks about where the different buckets of stress are, if you like. And they put stress into five different buckets, life changes, emotional, physical, environmental, and changes at work. And when we think about what the pandemic has done, let's just have a little think about this. Life changes, divorce or relationship breakdowns, the stress of the lockdown and what that did on people's relationships, and the COVID itself, the health scares or physical illness, either of yourself or of your loved ones, and of course, the amount of bereavement that occurred as a result of, the, of COVID. The emotional stresses of the coping with uncertainty. Never before have we been in a situation where we had no control over our lives, where we could go, when we could go, what we could do, or where things were coming back to normality. Everybody was affected with physical changes. I think if we're all putting our hands on heart and being a little bit guilty here, we're saying our diets went down the pan a little bit during lockdown, we might be drinking more, um, not eating as healthily, much less routine and many more late nights. And the environmental stresses, we've got two extremes there. You've got people that were living in isolation and alone, which was horrendous during the lockdown, and they're still reeling from these effects now. Um, or those that were adjusting to new situations where you've got your whole family all with you 24 seven, your teenagers, your small children, everybody else fighting for broadband, fighting for peace and quiet to get work done, absolutely incredibly stressful in a different way. And financial pressures of, of work, you know, are you going to be made redundant? Are you going to be furloughed? Um, and I don't know if anyone else noticed the same thing, but with me, I found that suddenly uh, timelines got
got so much tighter. Uh, what we used to be given two or three days to turn around, people expected done within a day because you weren't commuting anymore. So massive increases of workload, work pressure, that side of things. So it's not surprising that everybody's stress levels went through the roof with the pandemic. And so let's look at why mental health knowledge is so essential. I love this video. Check this out. This could be the most important video you see today. I want you to imagine that this rice represents the population of the world. The brown rice represents those people who will never experience a mental health problem. And the wild rice represents the one in four of us who will at some point in our lifetime experience a mental health problem. Let's just mix that up. Now when you have a mental health problem, your mind convinces you that you are the only one. But let's just take a pinch. That represents your family. This one's your friends and some work colleagues. It's a natural part of being human. So whether you're with your family, your friends or your colleagues, the likelihood is a few of those people at some point in their lives are also gonna struggle with their mental health. So even if you're not struggling, the chances are you're gonna brush shoulders with someone who is. So be kind, like this, and share it and follow for more. So I love that video um, just because it really does put it into context, just quite how common mental health issues are and how it is everywhere that they are so common. And the majority of us are not well informed about mental ill health. In some ways, a lot more are now than others because the pandemic has, has made people more interested in it. But still, the majority of us don't really know how to respond to a person experiencing mental ill health. So these are some stats prior to COVID-19, and they're quite, quite outstanding, really. And this was before the pandemic, don't forget. One in four people were diagnosed with a mental health issue per year. And at any stage, one in six working age adults will have symptoms associated with mental ill health. So by that, I mean, it could be the fact that they're not sleeping properly or they've got mood changes or they're socially withdrawing. But one in six at any one time prior to the pandemic then 28% of the total burden of ill health in the UK was attributed to mental ill health. Remember, this is before the pandemic, and you can compare this to 16% for both cancer-related um, burdens and cardiovascular issues. So even before the pandemic, they were more, mental ill health was more burdensome to the UK health economy than other disorders. And 45% of all working days lost to ill health were due to stress-related work. So it was bad before the pandemic. However, since the pandemic, and this is data taken from the ZOE uh, symptom study, a lot of people might have put that into their apps. Every time you're putting information into your phone on the NHS, symptom app this would be it so there's data for over 700,000 people and the startling statistic from that is the fact there are now 10 million extra people in the UK needing assistance with mental health issues it's the equivalent to the impact of World War II so the symptoms of depression we know have almost doubled and this is across all age ranges but it's particularly bad in the 16 to 39 year olds where it's nearly tripled and the 70 plus overs um, so where it's nearly doubled and that group in the middle of 40 to 69 have stayed a little bit more constant, but it's also anxiety as well. So another study from uh, the cognitive diagnostic uh, group study with 350,000 people showed that 42% of people were experiencing uh, daily anxiety. And again, in particular age ranges here, it's in the over 60s. And a lot of this is associated with loneliness. But 19 million adults in Great Britain report high levels of anxiety. So when we think about mental health issues in a pandemic, the two that I'm really going to draw attention to are uh, depression and anxiety. So let's have a little look at uh, polls now, because let's see generally how confident do you currently feel in supporting a person with mental health issues? So, uh, Andrea, if you don't mind launching the poll now, um, and oh, brilliant, so I don't have to stop sharing. So here is your poll, and it's a simple uh, five, uh, pick one of these five options. But how confident do you personally currently feel in supporting a person with a mental health issue? So are you really unconfident and worried that you're going to say the wrong thing? You're not that confident. You're OK. You're pretty good or you're so amazing at it. You think you should be paid for it for a living. So I will as I can't uh, see how many people have actually voted yet. Um, Andrea, I will leave it to you to decide when it is that you think that enough of the responses have come through uh, in order to share it. But basically, you're going to be in one of these five buckets, uh, either very unconfident, average or pretty confident. So uh, 
I'm hoping that in a minute or so, that should mean that we should get some results in. That's fine. And if you could share the results. Oh, brilliant. OK, so what? So we've got a couple of you that are really awesome. You're so good. You should be paid for it. I would love to hear more from you. Um, you've got uh, seven of you that think you're pretty good, but the majority of you are somewhere in the middle. You're OK, but you'd like to know more. And thank you very much for those three very honest people who are extremely unconfident and are scared they're going to say something wrong. Because I think probably that's what stops most people from trying to uh, assist anyone with a mental health issue. They're scared they'll do something wrong. And no matter what you take away from uh, this particular session, so long as you are kind, calm and caring, you cannot do anything wrong. That's what I would generally say as a rule. So if we just close this off now, and I'm hoping that the poll has now disappeared and we're back to the slides again. Um, so. Uh, really, the purpose of this session is when you look at someone who's unconsciously competent, someone who says, I'm really great to talk to all the time for a problem uh, with problems, but I just, you know, I don't really know why. And then you've got those that are completely unconsciously incompetent. Everyone you talk to is so super sensitive. It's their problem, not yours. Uh, and then there are some of those in the poll that just says, I'm, I'm really unconfident. You're consciously incompetent, if you like. Uh, you always say the wrong thing. And the goal of this session is really to give you some hints and techniques of what to say and what to do deliberately to put you into a conscious competence point of view. So you know exactly why it is that you are good to talk to and why people will turn to you, because then you'll do more of it. So let's look at stress signatures first of all. How do you spot the signs that someone's under too much stress and they're not coping very well? Because a little bit of stress in everybody's life is a good thing. It's a totally natural physiological reaction. We've had it since we were cavemen. But too much stress in someone's life and how much stress is too much stress is completely variable. Some people can take loads of stress, have no problems whatsoever. And we'll talk about their stress bucket being really big. Uh, and others can hardly take any stress at all before they start exhibiting these signs. So psychological signs, behavioral signs or physical signs that show they are not coping well with the level of stress that's in their life. So you may wonder why the color coding is here between what's in black and what's in red. All of these are signs, but those that have been I've put in red font here are those that are very easy to spot in yourself, but much harder to spot in someone else. So let's start with those. Feeling helpless or out of control, that's probably one of the most horrible things about being stressed. What tends to happen if we jump here to the fact that you've got difficulty sleeping is that you get into a vicious circle because all of your thoughts are running around your head all the time and either you can't fall asleep in the first place or even if you do fall asleep you can't stay asleep you'll wake up after a couple of hours with all of your thoughts and, and problems buzzing around making your stomach churn listening to your partner sleeping and snoring and getting really angry that's just me um but once you can't sleep, you become tired. And once you become tired, you can't concentrate. So we can see this over here because you're either too busy thinking about your problems or you're just not functioning well. And once you can't concentrate, you forget things. And once you forget things, you lose confidence. And then you might start to withdraw socially or start turning to alcohol or caffeine or nicotine. And then because of your high energy, your high cortisol levels all the time, you start feeling very run down and you get very constant recurrent infections potentially. We do the sort of whole arm oh, so tense you're carrying it around like the human turtle, all your muscles in your neck feel stiff and tight and then you get headaches, you may get heart palpitations, uh, you may lose your appetite or comfort eat. But you can see all of these signs, I'm sure you've spot, you can easily spot them in yourself and those in black you'll easily be able to spot in others because they're not concentrating, they might forget tasks or miss deadlines or behave erratically become more grumpy, become more irritable, become more tearful. So all of these things we know are there. And the difference is spotting the difference in someone's norm. Some people are naturally very grumpy, uh, in which case it's hard to tell if they become more irritable or not. But very often you'll see a big change in someone's personality. And that's what you're looking for. So when you consider what happens with stress, I'd like to introduce you to the stress bucket. And if you can imagine 
I mentioned earlier that some people are naturally very resilient and they have a very large stress bucket that can contain lots of stress before it starts overfilling. But some people only have a very small stress bucket and can only take a little bit of stress before they start running into problems. So you can imagine that stress starts filling this bucket and it starts getting to dangerous levels as you get towards the top. So this could be things like work stresses, relationship stresses, illness stresses, whatever they are. But eventually, if there are too many things filling up your stress bucket, you'll get to warning signs here. This is where you get uh, emotions, where you get um, stress signatures, we call them, those sort of not sleeping, losing your appetite, and that side of things. If you don't do anything to release some of the stress in this bucket and let it out, the bucket will overflow. And once the bucket is overflown, that's when you're in the realm of mental health issues. You've gone so far that you're now in the problems of things like anxiety, depression, and so on. So you can see that logically, it makes a lot of sense that what you need to do is have some form of tap that can drain out some of the stresses in your bucket when it gets too far. So when we look at overflowing of this bucket. These are the key stress-related mental health conditions of which suicide is the worst. Um, we've uh, self-harm and substance misuse, and I've touched on depression, and you've seen what's happened with the pandemic and depression uh, statistics pretty much doubling. But let's look at anxiety now, because that's the other one that the pandemic's had a huge effect on. And there are five different types of anxiety disorders. And the thing about them, I can explain what each of them are, but the thing about them is the fact that you can have more than one going on in a person at any one time. And the pandemic has increased all five of these types of anxiety. So you've got generalized anxiety disorder, which is where someone is just has a complete inability and fear that they can't cope with the future. And you can imagine how the pandemic's done something there. You've got panic disorders, which are panic attacks, which are very, very distressful for both the person having them or somebody witnessing somebody else having a panic attack because it resembles a heart attack very much you get shortness of breath and chest pain and sweating and just it's really unpleasant um, and people uh, often can have panic attacks and panic disorder in conjunction with these others. You've got phobias and irrational fear over something. So nowadays, people have irrational fear over social distancing or potentially going out because um, they are afraid that if they do go out, they're automatically going to catch COVID. Now, this is, there's a possibility, but it's, it's still an irrational one because taking the right precautions, this shouldn't happen. Then you've got post-traumatic stress disorder and acute stress disorder from witnessing traumatic events or being a participant in a traumatic event. It happens very often with emergency services. But what's happened with the pandemic is the frontline workers have now really been uh, privy to this, having to make these awful decisions, nurses having to hold hands of patients who are dying alone um, because none of their relatives were allowed in there, young people dying. And so post-traumatic stress disorder or watching a loved one suffering, even if you're not a frontline worker. And OCD, the obsessive compulsive disorder, where you feel that you have to repeat an action over and over again, in otherwise something terrible is going to happen. And look about the OCD now with hand washing, potentially, for an example, of people constantly having to wash their hands so many extra times a day unnecessarily because of the fear of catching COVID. So you can imagine that anxiety has gone through the roof and it has. So what can we do about it? Because that's really what we're interested in here. Understanding what you're looking at is important, but knowing what to do with it is equally, if not more important. So we talked about the stress bucket and everybody has different size buckets naturally, but how can you help? So the best way to explain this is looking at the stress vulnerability model. This is used in many, many models of mental health studies. And if you look at this graph here, what you can see is increasing vulnerability on the x-axis and increasing stress levels on the y-axis. And this curve here that's been drawn is based on a normal distribution. So in other words, it's saying that the average person here at this threshold level can take that amount of stress if you, tra if you track towards the left. It can take that amount of stress and still have no uh, stress signatures, absence of stress symptoms. So the average person can take 
bad amount of stress before they run into problems. That's Joe Bloggs average. But then you've got lucky person A over here who looks like they can take an extraordinarily high amount of stress and still have no stress symptoms. None of that sleepless nights, irritability, stomach churning, infections, all of those. So you've got person A who's really lucky and can take loads of stress before running into problems. And then you've got poor person B over here who can only take a little amount of stress before all those symptoms start occurring. So person A has a very, very big stress bucket and person B has naturally a very small stress bucket. So how can you help? Well, the reason why person A can take so much and person B can take so little is based in five different answers. So genetics, the genes that they've inherited, and that's why things like anxiety disorders can follow through in, in families. Then you've got someone's thinking style, their self-narration, what they say to themselves, their coping style. Do they have good coping mechanisms? Do they flap around or do they know exactly what they should be doing when things get hot? Uh, the environment that they're in, do they are they in a stressy or harmful environment and the social skills that they have, how well can they actually ask for help and communicate and get comfort from others. So the great news here is, as you can imagine, that you can give support. Guess what? You can have a little think about how many of those you can control and those that you can't. But the great news is that apart from genetics, you can either help yourself or help someone else in four of those five buckets. So in order to get person B up this scale and more towards person A, so let's get them to a point that they can take more stress increase their stress bucket, you can help. And let's have a little look at this now, how you can do it. So now we're really into the crux of this now in terms of how do you ease that person's aches that I talked about and their pain. And this is in their approach, how you start the conversation, what you assess for whilst you're having the conversation, the really important bit of how to really connect here and empathize with that person. So for those of you on the poll that said, I'm really, really not confident, I'm really hoping you're going to walk away with some great stuff here in order to increase your confidence. And for those of you that are already pretty good, I'm hoping to give you something new. Uh, and then the fifth part of how to help someone in mental distress is to offer them support and steer them to expert support. And all of this should be done within a framework of listening without judgment. And when we talk about listening in mental health, we talk about listening with your ears, obviously, because that's how you do it, but also listening with your eyes, checking to see, and we'll talk about body language congruence, and listening with your gut. Because if your gut is telling you that something's not right, most of the time you'll be right. And it's really, really important in mental health to be aware of what your gut is telling you. So let's start with the A, first of all. How do you start the approach? How do you start that conversation with someone who's clearly in mental distress? So let's look at some do's and don'ts here. And the top do's, really, a lot of this is common sense, is get the setting right. It doesn't matter if it's virtual or real life. Obviously, real life is better. But nowadays, we do so much through Zoom meetings. It's really important to make sure that that's still going correctly. And knowing things like where you're looking on the camera is important to make somebody feel that you're looking at them but it whatever be it virtual or be it real life make sure that you're going to be undisturbed by people or phone calls you've got to dedicate your time properly to that person and let them feel that they are properly you are in their zone it's got to be unrushed and you've got to be prepared both practically and mentally and then leave the communi communication door open. That's the other real do with your approach. I often say that mental health support is a marathon, not a sprint. You've got to build up trust slowly. So you can't expect someone who you don't know terribly well, or even someone who you do know terribly well with a very big problem to just throw it all at you in one go. And it's a slowly, slowly catch the monkey type of approach where you're building up trust all the time. And it's on their agenda, not yours, as to how much they share with you. In terms of the don'ts up there, I've said be prepared practically and mentally. What one of the key don'ts in mental health, we have an expression called you can't pour from an empty cup. So in other words, if you yourself are stressed out of your mind or completely preoccupied with something else, that's not the time to try and offer mental health assistance to someone else. You've got to be in a robust mental health, a mental state yourself in order to help someone well. And going back to this mental health support is a marathon, not a threat not a sprint don't force the issue you can't force someone to talk or open up it's got to be done at the pace that they want to follow 
And that's if it's a planned approach, if it's an unreact, if it's a reactive unplanned approach where someone just turns around to you, if you've got a minute, I'm feeling really bad. If it's if you're in that situation, if it is a bad time for you, be honest, reschedule to a time that does work for you. Don't try and squeeze in a quick chat whilst you're focused on another task because they'll know it. And you can say this in a sensitive, nice way. I'm so sorry. I really do want to help you. It's really important to me to be able to do that. But now is not a good time. Could we reschedule to or can I phone you another time point? Something along those lines. But don't be busy trying to pretend you're talking to them whilst you're mind is focused somewhere else because people will get that and in terms of what you're assessing for in mental health uh, we talk about mental health emergencies and there are two of the biggest mental health emergencies are the suicidal crisis and the psychotic crisis because a mental health emergency is when you think that someone is either in danger of hurting themselves or hurting somebody else that's the biggest emergency so uh, generally, I would say if it's in daytime working hours and this is a work related thing, then refer immediately to HR. And if it's outside daytime working hours or non work related emergency services are where you go to at this point, because you can't afford to to not act upon these things. Other mental health emergencies and some of the other mental health disorders, panic attacks and anxiety disorder. So you want to really make sure that there's a differential between are they actually having a heart attack or is this a panic attack? Uh, are they likely to faint if they're suffering from an eating disorder? If they're a user of self-harm, do they need stitching from some of the um, self-inflicted injuries or have they taken anything toxic? And are they high or, or are they uh, on alcohol? Uh, and is there aggression coming out? And when it comes to those type of mental health emergencies, again, HR, if it's daytime working hours, there are lots and lots of crisis helplines that you can go to, Samaritans, um, Calm, Shout, obviously, and Papyrus, which is for younger people, emergency services again. And don't forget, use your common sense. This goes back to using your gut. What do you think is the right course of action in terms of what's happening here? But this, as I said, is the most important bit of helping somebody to ease their aches, to really make them feel listened to, calmer, lighter, if you like. How do you connect with them? How do you really show them that you have heard what they're saying and that you're listening? And how do you empathize with them? And so when I think about mental health, I always think of the person I'm talking to. It's almost like you're blowing them up and making them feel a bit lighter. So you want to, I always feel that you want to inflate them. That's the way I think about mental health. And there are ways uh, of helping someone feel a bit buoyed up whilst you're talking to them. And these are the things we're going to cover here. Appropriate body language, voice, tone and pace. And then using open questions, paraphrasing. Something interesting I'm going to introduce you to called tentifiers, uh, use of fillers and silence. And then other things uh, such as validations and strength IDs. And so I'm going to introduce you and give you a flavor for what these different things involve and mean. And when you're talking to someone, if you really want to uh, connect with them and let them know they've been heard and empathize with them, you'll be using tools inside this balloon. However, it's very, very, very easy to pop the balloon. So those of you that said on the, on the uh, poll earlier, the two of you that said, I'm really not confident, what you're worried about is popping the the balloon and that you'll do this the minute that you show the person that you are judging them by what they're telling you and judgment comes from something called a frame of reference which I'll introduce you to judgment will be apparent in your body language and your voice tone and lack of understanding will be apparent when you come out with glib comments and these are things that are typical examples of glib comments so for those of you that say you're not confident and you're not sure what you're doing or why you're doing it take these out of your vocabulary if you can take these four comments out of your vocabulary, you already would have made a good step forward in terms of being able to help. Don't be silly. Think of all the positives. It's not so bad, at least. And OK, have you tried? Remove those from your repertoire of uh, statements and you'll already be doing a good thing to assisting someone in mental health. But let's, I introduced you to a term called the frame of reference. And the frame of reference is a really, really important thing to make you consciously competent of what you're doing. 
And so when we talk about the frame of reference, what we mean, it's really someone's window on the world. It's how they view things. It's how they view a situation, how they view a communication, whatever it is. And it's formed from their upbringing in loads of different ways. So it could be on their body size, the relationships they've had in the past, the people that they've met, teachers, professors, lecturers, workmates, bosses, family members, um, any cultural influences they may have. The frame of reference comes from someone's education or their gender identity or their political views or their citizenship or their marital status. All of these things will have an impact on the way that you view a situation. And when you're offering mental health support, it's absolutely essential that you don't give anything away from you about the fact that you differ in terms or you have a problem with what someone's saying because it interferes with your frame of reference. So when we talk about communicating and communication of messages, this pie chart here is it comes from something called the Moravian model. And it's how what you're saying impacts on somebody else. So. Uh, the way that you are conveying a message will come from the words that you're using, the voice tone that you have, and the body language that you're using. And so here's the pie chart here, and you can have a little guess with yourself before I put the answer up in terms of which of those three segments is the smaller. So which one of those do you think is the words? Which one of those three segments do you think is the voice? And which one of those three segments do you think is body language? And it's, it should may well surprise you that when you look at it, the bulk of the communication and the messages that you're giving are actually coming from the body language that you're using. 38% is coming from your voice, tone, pace and volume, and only 7% is actually on the words that you use. And the best example I can give you here is how this works with animals, because it makes no difference if you're talking to a human being or a dog. I have a dog at the moment and think how this message is going to land in terms of I adore this dog. I'm absolutely besotted by her. But I could turn around to her and I can say, I hate you, Nelly. You are the most disgusting animal I've ever seen. You are so vile. I want to kick you. I want to take you back to the dog shelter. If I say that to her, what she's actually going to get from that message is the fact that she's deeply loved. And this is amazing. If I do the reverse and say, you're the most disgusting animal I've ever come across. Slap, slap. I I hate you, whatever, all of those, or you're, sorry, I've got that wrong in my excitement to do, you're the most beautiful dog I've ever come across, slap, slap, shouting at her, all that sort of thing. She's going to interpret that as I hate her and that she's, and that she's not loved. Sorry, Nelly, she's um, getting jumpy on that. But the point is the fact that it's not the words that are making the impact. What's making the impact is the body language and the voice tone. So when you're offering mental health support to someone, you've got to make sure you get this right. So how could your frame of reference impact upon your communication? Let's have a little look here. So we talk about facial leakage and uh, matching the message. I've used my sister here as an example because she's got what I call a rogue eyebrow. So whatever she is thinking tends to come out in her face. So I asked her, I took pictures of her and I said, can you give me these different facial expressions and let's see if people can guess whether the facial expression matches up uh, to the actual message that you want to do so have a look and see do you think that message matches up it's fine nothing to worry about so if you can imagine that if you were an air hostess if you were a passenger on an airplane and you're going through massive turbulence and the air hostess comes over with that facial expression and says it's fine nothing to worry about what are you actually going to believe so you can say i'm going to give you a few of these examples now what about this one of course i believe you does the face match the message are you sure that's right? I'm happy for you. Oh no, that's terrible. I'm fine with that. I'm shocked. I'm listening and I really care. Of course, I care about what you're saying. You can see that there are different messages that you're some of these are incongruent so automatically immediately you can see that these five are incongruent and your body language is giving away something the person that's at the receiving end of that message will take away the message from your face not from your words because your words don't mean very much 
And when you're looking at these two here, yes, they're congruent. The body language is absolutely matching the words. However, do you actually ever want to let someone who you're, hope, who you're helping with mental health uh, issue, do you ever want them to know uh, that that's what you're thinking? So use your judgment here in terms of whether or not you think that's an appropriate message to be giving someone a mental health distress anyway. So the whole point is here. If you also have a rogue eyebrow, as you can see from this one here, there is a definite rogue eyebrow. If your face gives away a lot, make sure that you keep it a very neutral platform. This middle one here, these two middle ones are the best ones to be using, especially once you correct, you get the right words and the right voice tone. Those are safe, safe faces, if you like, for mental health assistance. But now let's look at uh, other bits in terms of how to really show someone that you're listening to them, they're being heard. Let's look at open questions and paraphrasings, tentifiers and fillers. So with open questions, they're just simple questions that will either make sure that the person that you're talking to can't give you a yes or no answer. It really helps somebody to open up. So questions to add to your armory, which are always useful, and I rely on these over and over again, especially if they've just thrown a lot of information at you and you haven't actually heard or not managed to remember or grasp everything they've said. One of my most favorite go-to questions is, that's a lot to deal with right now. What's bothering you the most? Because then you can really get into somebody saying, well, I, let me think about it. Okay, it's this. And then you get a chance to catch up again in terms of what it is that's bothering them. And then other really good staple ones. How can I help you? Who could help you? What else do you need? All these sort of things. They're classic coaching questions. And anyone out there that has man manager responsibility and has been on coaching courses before, you'll know that these are classic coaching questions. Um, Paraphrasing is just letting using the words that somebody else has said to reiterate again that you've heard what they're saying. So when you say, I heard you say that you felt hopeless or you mentioned you don't know how to speak to your partner, for example. Both of these things are clear clues that you have been listening to what they're saying and you want to know a little bit more. Some uh, the word tentifiers is up there now, and that's something that I learned through the shout training because the shout crisis counseling is words only. And we've already seen that actually body language and voice tone are so important in your message. So if you consider the fact that sometimes you might be having an argument with someone and you'll turn around and they'll say, I can see you're angry, and they go, I'm not angry, I'm upset. And actually what's really, really made them angrier is the fact that you've told them how they're feeling and that's not how they're feeling. They're not angry, they're upset. They're not angry, they're anxious, whatever it may be. So telling someone how they're feeling and getting it wrong is a great way to pop that bubble, pop that balloon. But if you can find a way of just testing the water a little bit, in other words, uh, I get the sense that you're feeling angry or would it be right to say that you're experiencing um, anxiety. It gives a much softer way of testing the water and saying for them to share and say, no, I'm not angry. I'm this, or I'm not cross. I'm that, or I'm not upset. I'm furious. Any of these things, but then you know that they're, that you're on their terms at that point. And that's why that's important. So tentifiers are just little phrases. Would I be right to say, I get the sense that you're feeling. And then fillers, just to get somebody to keep on talking all the time, because a lot of us are very uncomfortable with um, with silence. And so uh, when it gets to a silent or a silent bit, you want them to say more. You don't want to offer your stuff. It's not about you. So little fillers like I'm sure, absolutely, 100%. That's really tough. Um, I'd love to hear more. Um, or just nods and ooms are really good with mm, mm, or silence, because those people that are good coaches are very comfortable with silence. Very often, if you if you still just allow the silence, a lot of people are still processing their thoughts and they just want a little bit more time to get around it. So all of those are very good ways to make sure that you are connecting. And then now let's talk about empathizing. And I love this video. This is from Brené Brown, uh, who is an amazing uh, American uh, lecturer, if you like, on uh, connections with people. So let's hear what Brené Brown says about, uh, about empathizing. So what is empathy? And why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions 
very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. <laughs> recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, I'm down. I know what it's like down here. And you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, (laughs) it's bad, uh uh-huh. No, you want a sandwich? Um, Empathy is a choice and it's a vulnerable choice because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. At least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. (laughs) John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. So I love that video because it really does make it very, very clear in terms of just don't feel that you need to have the answers. And you know, when I said earlier about those glib comments, have you tried and at least, because the minute you say those sort of things, you are popping that balloon. Cause they're like, I, a lot of the time people don't want solutions. You know, a lot of the time there aren't solutions to be given. Um, because, you know, if someone's been bereaved, for example, what else is going to help? Going for a run is not going to help them particularly. So they just need time and they need to feel supported. So I often think of that video and I always think just be a bear, just be a bear. Uh, that's what's really important. So these validations that are there, a, a lot of the time people just want to know that what they're feeling is okay. You know, it's normal. It's totally normal to do that. Anyone would feel that way in that situation. It makes total sense as to why you would. And it's no wonder that because it, that's validating someone. It's saying you have a right to feel the way that you feel and what you're feeling is normal. So these are good phrases to add to that little armory. So, so far what we've talked about some of the things to take out of it and some of the things to put into it and then in strength ids this is another thing just to let someone know that what they're what they're being is good yeah you're bigging them up a little bit that's blowing that balloon it's such a brave thing to accept you've been so strong so far the fact that you're trying is what's important it's incredible you're still so together you're basically giving them clues to show that you're doing really well it's like encouraging them don't worry you're doing fine you can get there because that is one of the key things that you want to do to make someone feel supported that they're doing okay So you can imagine that when you put all of these things together and combine them, you're going to get some really powerful, great communication. And you put them into sort of little stock phrases. I understand that you're anxious and I think anyone would be in your position. But you've been so strong so far. What else could I or anyone else do to help? All of these things you can see, you add them in and connect them. So here, um, when we generally say is just, you know, when someone's going through a rough time, just sit with them. There's not solution giving, no preaching, no advice. Just let them know that you're there because just being there for someone is going to give them the most enormous amount of comfort. Now, I've brainstormed a few. I put them into six categories. We've talked about the open questions, the paraphrasing, the tentifiers, fillers, strength ideas and validations. And of course, we don't have time to go through all of these now. Now, this is what I brainstormed for me. Me. And very often what I have is the fact that sometimes I'll just pluck a few. I, like I know where they are. I almost I'm a, a visual person. So I sort of remember where they are. 
And I just know some of them work for me over and over and over again. Have you thought about, can you tell me more? Or that's a lot that you've shared there. What's the most important, those sort of things. But it's worthwhile you having a little think for yourselves, for those of you after this, what are the strength ideas? What are the fillers? What are the validations that would work for my personality style? And I'm quite happy to, to share a PDF of this slide uh, or some of the other slides if that's what people want in order to have something to go to. But have your own that work for you. That's the other golden rule of mental health assistance or just coaching generally. Use your language and your personality style. Only use stuff that works for you. Otherwise, you'll come across as insincere and that's not what you want to be doing. And uh, the final little section here that we're going to be looking at is uh, the support, the support and steer. So uh, you want to support them with information and practical and pragmatic tips. You want to support them with hope for recovery, that they're not always going to feel this way, that they're going to get through it. And you want to support them with guiding them to the expert support, internal or external. But your job, whenever you are supporting someone with a mental health issue, is not to advise. You're not a doctor and you're not a counsellor. Not to diagnose, you're not a doctor and you're not a counsellor, and not to offer solutions, because very often when you offer solutions, they're the wrong ones. Classic coaching, mental health assistance is all about letting the answers come from the person, let them find their solutions, what's right for them. But let's start, first of all, with looking at information and practical and pragmatic tips, because this is not about advising or offering solutions. This is a really nice coaching tool that you can use with yourself and use with anyone else as well. And we talked earlier about the stress bucket and we said that everybody has stresses that populate their bucket and some people have a big bucket and some people have a small bucket. But as an exercise for yourself after the session is over, I would advise you to do it if you're feeling stressed. And then if you are talking to someone else who is stressed and you want to help them, you can apply the same questions. So get you yourself, I would like you to draw out your stress bucket, first of all, and decide, first of all, how big is it? Do you naturally have a very big bucket, in which case you've got lots of room for manoeuvre? Or do you have a relatively small bucket, in which case you have to be very careful to let the stress out? And then fill in it all of the things that are causing you stress at the moment. Uh, work project, a person, a situation, a health issue, whatever it is. It could be a feeling even. I just feel miserable could go in there but populate it, write it down on a piece of paper. The only caveat here is be careful with this piece of paper. So if there's someone else in your house or in your office that you don't wanna see it, then obviously make sure you keep hold of this paper all the time and don't leave it exposed anywhere. But once you've populated it, start these questions. What can't you change and need to accept? Because there are some things in life you absolutely can't control. And people that are very resilient are generally quite aware of the fact they can't control everything and they only work on things that they can control. So, for example, you can't control the weather. So if you're planning something that requires outside use, you can't you can you can rate your chances and think, well, if it's in summertime, it stands a better chance of being OK. But you still can't guarantee, especially in England, the weather's going to be fine. So you can have a, a canopy or outside heaters or something. And that's what's required. So first rule of resilient is what can't you change and need to accept? because there is no point in trying to control the universe with your mind. And you will waste a whole lot of external emotional energy trying to do this. So once you actually look at the things that are in your stress bucket, you just gotta have faith it's gonna be okay and it will pass. Then look at the things that you can control. What can you change? And out of all of those things that you can change, what's the most urgent? So you're prioritizing, you're not being overwhelmed by everything in the bucket. You're having a much more objective look at it. And then who else can help you with these priority things and what are you currently doing at the moment that's not helping yourself are you staying up too late are you uh, drinking too much are you eating too unhealthily have you stopped your exercise regime all of those are unhelpful coping strategies and then what are some of those things that are helpful like, is there a certain person that you talk to or a certain activity that you do that, you know, makes you feel a bit better? Uh, and do you have any thinking sins? And by that, I mean, you might have written in there something like I can't cope. And so challenging thoughts and feelings is the basic of cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT. Uh, and I'm a big lover of CBT therapy. Um, so that's a different ball game altogether in terms of looking at resilience. But it doesn't necessarily mean that just because you're feeling something, it's a true stressor for you. 
And then let's look at the tap. That's the last thing we want to be doing before we break for questions, because it's really, really important that you know what your own taps are to let your stresses out the bucket. And it's really, really important that you help somebody else identify what their um, what their tap is to open it. So generally what happens, and you can have a little look at some of these things on there. That's just a brainstorm from me. But the reason why I put those things up there is what happens with stress is the fact your thoughts are going round and round and round in your head all the time. You can't stop generating them. That's impossible. Um, but what you can do is decide whether or not you want to accept that thought or just let it pass. And so very often, if you're involved in a task that is so consuming of your attention, you stop your thoughts from going round a little bit. You give your brain a little rest. And so the activity that you're doing that stops your brain from going right, it could be something really nice like yoga, or if you're lucky, you can meditate, or it could be singing in a band, or it could be going for a walk and concentrating on nature, or it could be doing a crossword puzzle or Sudoku or listening to music or exercise, going for a run. But it could also be a, a boring task like cleaning out a closet, closet or a drawer or stuffing letters into envelopes. The whole point about the tap means that you have to be so focused on the task that you're doing that actually you give your brain a rest from your thoughts. And there are a couple of things down here. Animals for me is what works. My personal uh, side of things is that I volunteer at a dog, dog shelter and I couldn't work out why when I used to spend a couple of hours down there that I came away just feeling so light and so much more relaxed. And so uh, for me, what I realized was the fact that whilst I was working at the dog shelter, I'm so, so focused on the dog that I am actually working with or thinking about the dog that I'm going to be taking out next, that my brain has a little rest from other stresses that are in my life. And there's something there called 54321 grounding, which is a little bit like mindfulness, where uh, you are concentrating on the moment. So you are so focused, uh, you're thinking on five things, you have to identify five things that you can uh, see, four things that you can hear, three things that you can taste, two things that you can smell. Uh, I've got that wrong because I'm being distracted. So you, you're sorry, five things that you can see, four things that you can hear, three things that you can feel, two things that you can uh, smell and one thing that you can taste. And by concentrating on your senses, that keeps you going. And the most important thing is to identify yours and schedule its time in your schedule its time in your diary. So. These are practical and pragmatic things. Find your tap, stay connected, be kind to yourself, check your self narration, be occupied and be really honest when you are feeling too stressed and go and get that help. So the help that you're really going to be doing is you're going to be steering if your internal support to your HR services, your EAP program, a lot of companies have those or your company specific resources and initiatives and external support very often will start with the GP local counselling facilities, peer support groups. Google is great for these things, local or national charities uh, and crisis helplines or citizens advice bureaus. So there are lots and lots of courses that I run, but for now is a great time to stop and uh, ask for any questions from the group. So over to you, Deborah. Hi, um, thank you so much, Laura. <clears throat> Sorry. A few people had problems, I think, with sound during that, but it looks like the sound recording is fine. So. If you do want to go back, we'll be popping this on our YouTube channel later on, and you should be able to hear everything absolutely fine there. Um, we do have a couple of questions. The first one is enjoying the presentation. In your experience, what are the benefits of having a nominated or uh, uh, publicised mental health first aider? I think it's absolutely invaluable now that there is people inside each company that uh, are the go to place and are properly trained up in order to assist someone. I think that they are a marvellous resource to have. Um, more and more people have them now as a result of the pandemic. More and more people went out, reached out for training um, because it's it's good to have someone. The other thing that a mental health first aider will have as part of their training is a lovely resource pack. And in the resource pack is a whole lot of different things uh, for all the different mental health conditions. And this is where you're steering them to expert support. So having trained up people that know what they're doing and a designated person to go to it that wants this role, I think is absolutely invaluable. And I think every 
every every company should have them. Hopefully one day it will be a legal requirement. It's certainly been voted on in Parliament uh, uh, to become uh, you know mandatory, but so far there's no legislation in place and maybe the pandemic will make that happen, but invaluable resources, thanks. Is there, and we've got another question, is there a balance between being emotionally supportive and emotionally dumping? And how do we communicate kindly if you're not in the best place to support someone? And I think that goes back to the do's and don'ts and also knowing uh, where your, where your uh, responsibility lies. Uh, so if in terms of emotional dumping, uh, sometimes there may be that the, that's where uh, I think that if you're in a hurry, you need to be able to sit there and say, I'm really sorry, this isn't a good time. Do you want to schedule some time in? Let's see how we're going. Um, if they are emotionally dumping, are they always at it? Yeah, I think this has to be looked at on an individual basis um, because we know that there are some people naturally out there that I would refer to as energy drainers that are always, always emotionally dumping. And very often those are the sort of people that really, really do need expert support. Um, so I think very often in coaching, we talk about having um, coaching contracts set up in advance beforehand. If you know you're constantly dealing with the same person that's always doing this, perhaps you need to draw up a contract with them in advance that clearly lays out a boundary of, of where things are going, the number of times you might meet and that side of things. It's difficult because I have a feeling this is very much on a personal individual basis rather than everybody doing that. So you take each person as they come. Thank you. And then we have another question. What is your opinion on mental health links with the menopause in women? Um, it's not a, it's, I'm not quite sure. I'd like to know a little bit more about uh, what's inside that question, because I think any mental health supports to any particular, and we know that menopausal women absolutely uh, suffer with, with more mental health issues for many reasons. Hormones are, are so responsible. So the more expert support you can get from mental health for different issues, the better it would be. So I would be a massive advocate of the fact that there should be mental health supports with uh, menopausal support and information agencies, because you're almost getting expert niche support at that stage if that's what that question was about and if the person want if I haven't answered that question then uh, I would uh, say do uh, do ask again the more specifics of what you are after there okay, and then we have another one in the steer section you referred to an EAP what is ah, that so that's an employee engagement program which sorry that's me using shorthand because most of the corporations that I use come from that so a lot of companies have something called uh, um, the or the external uh, support type mechanism. So uh, employee uh, employee support. So the, the best way to just take that, just ignore that I put that in there. And I would suggest if that's confusing you as a term, just ask your individual employer if they have any specific, normally it would be the HR department that controls this. Uh, and, uh, and just uh, see what are the internal resources that have been put in place. But an EAP program is sort of, a, it tend to be a standard terminology going across most corporations. Yeah, and then we've got time for a couple more. The first one is, what can you suggest to help approach or support someone that's constantly very negative? <laughs> that <laughs> I live I, I have a I have a family member who is very much that and that's where CBT really comes in um, because uh, there are lots of CBT therapy is about challenging thoughts and I would suggest that someone who is really really negative would benefit greatly from a CBT therapy course or you can even do online things with CBT uh, but very often what happens with these negative thoughts is the fact you have to go back to the fact you have to challenge them I'm so miserable. Well, are you miserable? What are there things that you're not miserable about? What would your friends say? What would this do? Challenging thoughts is one of the most important things to do to keep yourself resilient and mentally healthy. And somebody that is incredibly negative all the time, their self-narration would be really bad. So CBT for them would be absolutely it. And find something that makes them feel good. Find what their tap is, because the minute you can help them identify what their tap is, uh, you may find that they get a bit, they get a bit lighter. Okay, we've got time just for two more quick ones. One of them is a follow on, I think, from that. And it said, with mental health services stretched to the limit, do you think it's useful for companies to buy in CBT for emergencies? And then a very quick one after that that somebody's asked. And it said that if you ask a colleague, if, if you spot signs of someone having a mental health issue at work and you ask them if they're okay, and they reflect back that they're fine and they're offended, that you've even suggested that, 
um, it can have a negative effect on other team members and line managers. Um, and can you help with that too? I'm afraid that's the last two questions we've got time for. Uh, one of the questions is quicker to answer, I guess, which is the fact that I think any way that you can get expert support brought into your company, I would suggest absolutely always do it, particularly if it's if uh, you know national services are, are stretched. Um, in terms of the other one, I have a feeling that if you go back to the balloon and you think about the way that your impact is, if you ask someone if they're okay and you do it in a clumsy way that makes it look like you're intruding, because somehow down the line, either your body language or your voice tone or something is wrong, you will get them to do that. But generally, um, if it's done in the appropriate setting, quietly, on its own, with genuinely care, and are you okay is, is one way of saying things. The other thing is, what we say now with suicidal um, it, things on the increase so much, you ask twice. So, so long as you've said it nicely in the first place, I would be uh, it is. I would be surprised if someone got offended by saying, are you OK? Because it's it's the subtlety of how you're doing it. But the other thing is, if someone genuinely you can see they're not doing well and they say, are you OK? Are, are you okay? And they go and they'll, they'll, they'll say, yeah, I'm fine. And they say, are you really OK? You ask twice and you check your body language and check your voice tone, because those are the two things that are going to get someone to open up far quicker. Remember than the words that you use. So just tread carefully. It, it would be my would be my answer. But if you do it with genuine kindness, you can't go that far wrong. Thank you so much, Laura. We've got quite a few more questions, but we've sadly run out of time. So, Laura, is it OK if I maybe send you some of those questions over afterwards? Sure, of course. That's brilliant. Uh, Thank you. What, yeah, perfect. <laughs> Thank everybody so much for your time. And we will be having another event. Uh, our events will start again early next year. And we'll notify you of when they when they will be and what they will be. And thank you again for, to Laura. It's been an amazing session today. And I think I definitely learned something. And it's just been brilliant. Thank you so much. Pleasure.